The concept of mail has been around for as long as writing has existed, allowing people to transport things from one person or place to another through a postal service. On a semi-related note, around 1996 in Edmond, Oklahoma, Patrick Sherrill killed 14 people and injured another 6 before ending his own life. This, alongside the many other postal workers committing similar violent acts, coined the term going postal for when someone out of seemingly nowhere gets angry to the point of violence. Fucked up, isn't it? Well, that's not what the story is about, so let's skip forward to the middle of the 90s. A man named Vince James Desiderio Jr., or Vince Desi for short, alongside Michael J. Ridiel, not to be confused with Mike Jarrett who everyone just calls Mike J, another name we'll be hearing a lot, founded Ridiel Software Productions, a company so irrelevant that it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. RSP focused on making licensed edutainment games for kids, but that's incredibly boring. So around 1996, RSP decided to create a separate company, RWS, or Running of Scissors, which was meant to create adult-oriented games. Their first title was Postal. Of course, that became very infamous for many reasons and eventually spawned a franchise that's still going on to this day. What's the appeal? What are the games even about? Are you a mailman? Why is there a big difference how the critics reviewed it and what the players thought of the game? My goal today is to explain the entire franchise to you and hopefully convince you to play it. And if you're already a Postal fan like me, hopefully you'll learn something new too. Also, a couple notes before we start. First off, this video had to be censored so it wouldn't be absolutely destroyed by my algorithmic overlords at YouTube. Profanity won't be censored, but names of certain groups like, let's just say very mean Germans, will be. This video is long. Assume that every time you see a cutscene without my voiceover, it's a cut down version of that cutscene instead of how it's shown in the game. Also, since I had to read over 20,000 words from this script, it was recorded in many sessions over two months. So forgive me if I sound different in different parts of the video, because I also got sick a couple times. Oh yeah, content warning. Got that? Let's begin. If you only ever heard of the other Postal games, you might find it surprising that the first game in the series is almost nothing like the rest. You play as the Postal Dude, yes, that is actually his name, and your goal is to kill a certain number of hostiles on the map before proceeding to the next one. The dude is faced by Rick Hunter, Don't be a sissy. at least on the surface. If you check the audio settings, you'll see your voice is labeled as Demon. Bleed, bleed. And if you set yourself on fire, you will notice that the screams are voiced by a different person. This spawned a theory that the dude is possessed during the entirety of Postal 1, which was confirmed by Rink of Scissors on multiple occasions. The story is told through the ominous loading screens and the manual. The in-game text seems like the ramblings of a truly evil person. Blessed are the meek for they make easy targets. The air ripens with the odors of the dead and dying, it smells like victory. But they also include some humor. Life is cheap, death is free, act now, supplies are limited, over void in Arizona. From the halls of the Vatican to the runways of truth, we are here. At a place called Climax and the time called now. When it's done, let the gods sort it out. Remember this one for much, much later. The manual entries are much more cohesive. They reveal that the game takes place in paradise, a real life deserted city in Arizona. After the dude moved in, he started hearing things. Gunshots, screams after dark. He's also being evicted from his house, which really isn't helping his mental state. After a group of lunatics try to invade his home, he tries to get any help he can but finds nothing but more lunatics. He suspects that this must be caused by some sort of sickness and that he is the only sane person left. At this point, he decides that he must seek answers at the Air Force base. This is also the time where the manual switches from a diary to a war journal. He eventually gets there, kills everyone and leaves. I personally believe that the loading screens come from the demon, being much more platforsty, while all the dude wants to stop what he believes to be a virus that turns people mad. Even though the dude's foes are much more coherent, he obviously suffers from some sort of mental illness. For example, you can press K to hear the now iconic line I regret nothing. and commit something that I can't mention on YouTube. It's definitely an edgy game. I mean, for fuck's sake, you can press a button to execute people bleeding out. But it's the right kind of edgy. In 2015, a game very inspired by Postal called Hatred came out. It tries to do the same thing as Postal but totally overdoes it, trying to be edgy so hard that it becomes more comedic than dark and, dare I say it, cringe. My name is not important. What is important is what I'm going to do. I just fucking hate this world and these human worms feasting on its carcass. My whole life is just cold, bitter hatred. And I always wanted to die violently. This is the time of vengeance, and no life is worth saving. And I will put in the grave as many as I can. It's time for me to kill. 
And it's time for me to die. Postal is edgy enough to be off-putting, but not edgy enough to the point of being laughable like hatred. With most of the story behind this, I should probably talk about the game itself, and it's alright. If you have eyes, you probably notice that it's an isometric shooter, but it does switch to a bird's eye view for some of the levels. The game actually got updated in 2015 and 2017 to support things like widescreen and to make the controls more bearable. My biggest issue is how sometimes you'll shoot the hostile with the shotgun once and they go down, and sometimes seemingly the same enemy will take 5 close shotgun shots to the face and they'll still be alive. To progress to the next level, you first have to kill a certain percentage of host slays in the level and then press F1, which isn't mentioned anywhere in the game aside from the controls menu. The percentage usually sits at around 80 to 90%, and since some of the levels are a pretty decent size, you'll often wander around looking for the last couple enemies. This, alongside the art style of the levels and some of the ambience, makes the walks through the corpse salt levels feel somewhat disturbing. The ending is definitely the most infamous part. Keep in mind that this is a cutscene and not something you can control. It's clear that this didn't actually happen, but was just a vision, and a very fucked up one at that. The credits end with the demon laughing, which signifies that the dude may have somehow escaped his confinement. This isn't the end of what Postal has to offer. In 1998, an expansion pack came out, Postal Special Delivery, which has four new levels to the game. It's not clear if this takes place during the middle of Postal, after the end, it's not even clear if this is canon, or if anything is canon in this franchise for that matter. The levels definitely have a less serious vibe than the base game, which started a shift in tone, fully noticeable by the next game in the series. The first level is set in a supermarket. What? You don't sell postal? The second one in Shantytown. The third one takes place during an earthquake, and the last one at a resort where you can shoot elderly people. These don't offer anything new in terms of gameplay, like weapons or enemies, they're just more levels. There's also, in a way, a second expansion pack. When Postal released in Japan under the name Super Postal, it contained two new levels, Osaka and Tokyo. These ones again aren't anything special, just more levels, but the people scream in Japanese. <laughs> Another thing worth mentioning is the Santa patch, which came out in December 1997 and added new voice lines. Santa must die. Replaced the grenade throwing enemies with Santa Claus, reskinned the throwable weapons into presents, and gave us Sergius reindeer costumes. All things considered, Postal is a pretty decent game. You can download it for free on Steam and GOG, and I recommend giving it a try. There's also an Android port that you can get for one dollar, and it may or may not work on your mother phone. Moving on from the first postal, how does the far more famous and infamous sequel compare? Now, if you know literally anything about postal, do you may be questioning how did we go from this? to this. In 
you would be right to ask that question. Apparently, it was a natural progression for the series according to Vince Desi. The the notion that it's we've gone from dark to light, from depression to humor, I kind of really feel it was a natural evolution because Either way, who cares? Aside from the game being a dark comedy now, it's also in first person, allowing for even bigger immersion than before. The core structure is different from the first game. Instead of having you go from level to level in a linear fashion, the game has an entire open world, with you getting more and more tasks each in game day, which only changes once you finish all current objectives. You could also be curious about how this game connects to the previous one story-wise. I can't answer that question, as no one is really sure. The two games have some shared elements like the town name, voice actor, although now Rick Hunter just plays the dude, not a demon, and some sound effects including the ambience. The ambience of Postal 1 was amazing, and it really fits Postal 2. From the ambience, through the orange apocalyptic sky, how the textures look, Postal 2 has this very specific feel to it. When you're not in the middle of a mission or causing random chaos, you'll do a lot of walking around. There aren't any working vehicles in the game, the cars are just oversized exploding barrels, just your pretty slow run and an even slower walk. The amount of walking combined with the somewhat dreadful atmosphere actually reminds me of the Russian game Pathologic, in which you're a doctor tasked with helping a town get rid of a local plague. In that game you also walk a lot either in silence or with weird ambient in the background. And I really mean a lot of slow walking from place to place. I wouldn't recommend anyone try to play Pathologic, but it's at least interesting how a dark comedy and a serious game about a plague can both manage to feel similar at times. Postal 2 pulls no punches. It will make fun of whatever and whoever it wants, from violent video game protesters through postal workers to the Taliban. The weapon arsenal is absolutely giant compared to Postal 1. You can kill people with anything from a scythe to a diseased poisonous cowhead which makes people puke blood until they die. A famous addition is the ability to press a rat any time and unzip your pants allowing you to piss with a scary amount of accuracy and for way longer than any healthy person could urinate. You can actually use this to your advantage. You can unzip in public to get arrested and take a shortcut to the police station. You could piss on people to distract them mid-firefight, and you can even piss on yourself when you're on fire to put yourself out. Another thing you can do is use an alive cat as a silencer for the shotgun and the machine gun. And I will use this as a segue to talk about potentially the most interesting thing about the entire game. It's only as violent as you are. Sure, you could find a machete, go to some random dude, hack off every single one of his limbs, put him on fire as he is crawling and begging for mercy, and then piss on him to put him out right before he dies, but you could also just... not do that. You could rob a bank as a way of cashing your paycheck, but you could also just wait in line like a normal person. You could go up to Gary Coleman and get a signed copy of his book, or you could blow his head off with a shotgun. The game feels designed to make you go post yourself, having very slow lines, NPCs that insult you, decent length folks between the runs, etc. From one point of view, going postal is letting the game win, by passing your own morals for the sake of getting things done faster. But from a different point of view, it's way more fun to rob a bank and then murder everyone else left on the map than to wait in line. It's also important to mention that some missions have none obvious ways to complete them. For example, using an item obtained on a previous day in exchange for another item. The game is only as violent as you are, is also a great way to deflect moralist arguments. Can you say the game is violent when every violent act is purely optional something that you decide to do? While I can't tell you how exactly is Postal 2 related to the first one in terms of story, I can tell you what happens in the game itself. You can try connecting the puzzle pieces yourself, if there even are any. I'll go through the game day by day, while talking about game mechanics when they're relevant. If you wish to avoid spoilers, go play the game yourself. It's cheap, has very low system requirements, Requirements and it's only a couple hours long after all. Today's the first day of the end of your lives. The game opens with some foreshadowing. Then you see a homeless man dancing and hear someone get kicked in the balls. Here's one for your mother. Ow! This is a clear sign to anyone that this isn't anything like the first postal. The main menu featured some random items flying around in a weird red fiery area, which did in a way resemble the weird loading screens from the previous game. The game once again takes place in Paradise, Arizona. We get to meet the new postal dude once again voiced by Rick Hunter. After that we learn that his car is broken and that he has to do some chores. You have to get a paycheck from running with scissors, you have to cash the paycheck at the local bank, and buy some milk at Lucky Ganesh. You can do this in any order you want, or you can totally ignore them and just fuck around in the open world. Every day more and more of Paradise opens up to you. New items appear, including increasingly powerful weapons. Alongside this more and more of the government will appear. Anything from the police to the National Guard. Luckily, the police here doesn't act like how they do in GTA or Red Dead Redemption, where you could kill someone in the middle of nowhere and get cops on your tail. Here, a cop has to actually see you commit a crime for you to get a wanted level. Of course, the first thing I did after starting the game is grab some crack and a shovel, rob my neighbor and then murder 
murder him for absolutely no reason. If this game is a test of morality, I already failed. Thank you, Chump. Chump is the dude's dog, based on Vince Desi's real life dog. Putting your dog in a game where a lot of people will kill anything they see? How wholesome. Anyways, arguably the most important item in the game is crack. The game calls them health pipes, but come on. Smoking one makes your HP go up to 125, more than the normal maximum of 100. The downside of using one is that if you don't take another after the dude complains about feeling like shit, you'll experience withdrawal and lose HP. Anyways, if you see people holding flowers in my footage, that's because I recorded all of it on February 15th, and that's near Valentine's, so the Valentine's event kicked in. The milk errand is the closest to the starting point, and it's also a great example of the many ways to finish missions. You can wait in line and pay for the milk, you can kill the cashier and run out, or you can try to run without killing him, which will cause the doors to lock, so you'll have to escape through the many gun-wielding Easter stereotype wives. You can also take this semi-secret path and go through the underground tunnels that contain some explosives alongside invincible hell dogs. The rocket launcher in this game is pretty cool. The longer you hold left click, the more fuel you use, but your rocket will fly further. And if you charge it for long enough, the rocket will turn into a heat seeking rocket. Next, I went to get my paycheck. Dude apparently works at Rainico Scissors, which is a decent enough excuse to put Rainico Scissors employees in the game. In front of the building, you can see something I'm gonna call postal bait. Despite the fact that they make some valid points, could you honestly listen to these people chant and walk in circles for more than 15 seconds? No, so you'll probably brutally murder them. Despite only starting yesterday, you already get fired, and the building gets torn by some protesters. Nothing personal, man, but you're fired. <laughs> but I just started yesterday. <laughs> Come on, everyone, follow me! This is my biggest issue with the game. I can spam every key on my keyboard all I want, but most of these mid-level cutscenes are unskippable. I get that you should know what's going on in your first playthrough, but since the game already checks if you beat the game and unlocks some stuff, why not make this skippable if you beat the game once? After you shoot or run your way out, you'll notice your map screen updated. Everyone who has a photo on your map hates you. If they notice you, they'll start attacking you. You can either defend yourself or get a nearby cop to take them down. There's also another way to evade them, but I'll save that for later. The last thing you need to do on Monday is to cash out your paycheck. You don't actually need to get your paycheck first. What I recommend doing is going on top of the bank and smashing some glass. This will distract the NPCs and cause them to leave the line. If you cash out your paycheck the normal way, a bunch of bank robbers appear. Of course, I then did the right thing, which is take the money before they could. Doing it in this order allows you to double what you get from this mission. Every day the bank safe refills with more and more money. So I recommend going to rob it each day and then I recommend going to buy crack right next to the bank. Every day the price of crack across town increases by $100 with the starting price being 100. To end the day, just look for the nearest loading zone. They are usually marked by these yellow signs. Did you go by work? Yeah, apparently I'm uh, on sabbatical or something. Well, good. Maybe you can get a few more things done for me. I'm gonna do a few things to you. What was that? Nothing, dear. Enjoy your milk. Since I already covered most of the basics, if you'd rather avoid spoilers, here are the timestamps to individual days. Hi there, would you like to sign my petition? Tuesday is one of my favorite days in this game. You have to confess your sins, which, yeah, fair enough. Get signatures on a petition to make any congressman play violent video games. Return a book to the library and get Gary Coleman's autograph. Gary Coleman is actually played by Gary. There are a bunch of old videos of him doing mock-up and voice acting for the game. There is also this one where he plays Postal 2 with the arrow keys like a true chad. Rest in peace legend. There's a marching band in town. Isn't it weird that you can hear a bunch of instruments even though they all got the same one? You can do the petition task anywhere, just get a couple NPCs to sign. The game prompts you to not stop when they say no. You can ask everyone three times, and the more you ask a single person, the more threatening the dude will get. Hi there, would you like to sign my petition? Sorry, yo. You look, just sign the stupid petition. I've got stuff to do. Sorry, yo. Shh, sign this petition or I'll follow you home and kill your dog. Ah! I got Gary's autograph first. I was looting them all for so long that there were only two people left in line, so I decided to wait. After you get your book signed, the police will raid them all with a warrant for Gary's arrest. Instead of joining the fight or getting out of there, I recommend standing aside and watching junky mid-2000s AI try to fight each other. Big AI fights are always entertaining in this game. I may or may not have killed Gary, and I escaped to the only place where a new take couldn't find me, virtual reality.
This is one of those things added in an update. The old versions of the game had a message saying closed for renovation, reopening June 2016. And when that date came, they added the Snitch Secret Area. This is mostly just an ad for Postal XX, the 20th anniversary edition of the franchise which I do actually have, and the other Postal games. There are a bunch of game parodies on the shelf which is a neat detail. You want another cool secret? In this map, the one next to the church, you can crouch jump onto these parts and then make this awkward jump around the corner. There you can find the beta shotgun. You can silence it with a cut but it does way more damage which is a fair trade-off. It's also one of the only weapons that you need to reload after a couple shots, in this case 6. The next errand I did was confessing my sins. This is also when I found my first edged weapon. These weren't originally in the game, they were added through updates and expansions. They're extremely overpowered, pretty much guaranteeing that you'll chop off at least one limb every hit. I stole the offering box and chopped off the head of everyone I saw to get some footage. In the meantime, the line to the confessional got way shorter, so I decided to just wait and confess without killing the priest. Bless me, Father, for I have really sinned. Really? I'm not kidding here. Big sinner. Yep. Did you drop an offering in the box? Well, not exactly. Yes. Then you are forgiven, my son. Next! Thanks. Al-Qaeda invades the church right after and you have to fight your way out. The last thing left to do is to return the book. No idea why I didn't do it first, it's the closest to the starting point. Be sure to quick save before dropping the book. If you do it at a weird angle, the book might get stuck in a way that you can't pick it up, but it won't trigger as you drop it into the box either. Finally, it's about time you showed up. Sorry I'm late. Somebody blew up my car. Yeah, that was probably me. I like this section, it's pretty fun. You can skip the entire thing with a crowd jump, but still. Did you get Gary Coleman's autograph? I can get a small fortune for it on eBay. <laughs> right, a small fortune. Say, aren't those things more valuable after the person is, uh, deceased? Yes, why? Uh, no reason. Can I borrow your computer? That line hits different after the real Gary Coleman died. Hmm, while I'm in the neighborhood, I suppose I should leave something for the old man. On Wednesday, you need to piss on your dad who just so happens to live at the local cemetery, vote, and get a Christmas tree. All that is not important because the real task is to find a double barrel. You can find it in a bush near the police station, this shotgun removes any difficulty the game might have had. Its only weakness is that you have to reload after two shots, but that doesn't matter if everyone is already dead. What fucking moron designed this? The voting mission is just an excuse to make fun of the Florida recount and how confusing the United States voting system is. You don't even get to choose, you just spam left click. It would have been cool to have your choices affect the game, like maybe voting for one person over the other could make the world more chaotic. After that I got the Christmas tree and since it was along the way I took a trip to the local police station. You can actually steal a police uniform from here. It will change how the head looks but more importantly the police will ignore basically anything you do. It also grants you access to the police armory. You can do this since Monday, but I usually don't do it until Wednesday or Thursday because early in the game there isn't enough government presence to actually be an issue. Another thing along the way is the zoo. Now if this isn't postal bait, I don't know what is. The annoying marching band and giant elephants. The dude is fairly picky about which tree he wants. Too dry. Not that one. Not right. I don't think so. You gotta be fucking kidding. Ah, this must be the one. He's looking at my favorite Christmas tree, Earl. I'm gonna make him squeal like a chicken. Whoop, whoop. You might be noticing a pattern at this point. You go and grab something, something goes wrong and you have to fight your way out. While this might sound repetitive, the game isn't that long and each time you fight in totally different environments making the fights feel unique. Skipping forward a bit because Wednesday is pretty boring compared to the rest of the game. You can see that the church has been taken over by the Al-Qaeda. You can find some edged weapons here alongside more Postal 1 ambience. You can find an axe and a scythe, both of which are pretty cool. The gravestones actually contain things that were cut from the game, so if you ever want to know what could have been cut from a game like this, now you know. Oh my god, Billy! 
Billy Bob, now he's got the shovel. <laughs> Please, I'll never do that again. Oh my God, I'm the damn camp. Oh great, now my day is complete. I really like this level, being forced to fight with a limited arsenal adds some challenge which the game really lacks, especially if you got the double barrel. This playthrough was an average difficulty, the higher ones make you deal and take more damage and give NPCs more powerful weapons. The highest difficulties also introduce some other mechanics, like allowing you to only save once per area and changing crack from something that you use from your inventory to a glorified medkit. I personally think the higher difficulties make the game more annoying than hard. At least you can make your own difficulty by typing the Konami code on the difficulty menu. Getting to this point adds a new errand. You have to get your clothes back from the laundry. Once you get outside, people will constantly make fun of you for wearing a game suit, making you more likely to go postal on them. Once you get your clothes back, you can finally rest for the night. A Christmas tree! I can't wait to decorate it. Yeah, it was pretty cheap since it's July and all. Well, I hope you voted today. Your choices will affect the future. <laughs> no, they won't. You don't say. What was that? I said, uh, do we have any beer? I worked up a killer thirst today. Look, we both know you have one of those toys stuffed up your ass. How much do you want for it? On the first day you need to get napalm, get a crotchy doll to probably resell on ebay, get some steaks for a barbecue and pay a traffic ticket despite not having a working car. I started doing the usual routine, killing the neighbor, robbing the bank, buying a shitload of crack, you know. After that I of course paid the traffic ticket. The steaks are on this fun, you actually uncover a conspiracy of sorts. The meat is actually mostly made from homeless people, that of course doesn't stop the dude from getting some anyway. You can find a diseased cow head here, throwing it at someone causes them to puke blood and ragdoll, pretty cool. I also found this amazing machete, it chops off limbs extremely fast and you can throw it like a boomerang. Combined with catnip which will slow down everything around you for a limited time, you can make some pretty cool looking moves. After you grab your steak, the police will raid the place. Fortunately, I stole a police uniform so I could just walk past them like it's Hitman. Next, I went to get the napalm. Hi there. Hello, miss. I need to buy some napalm. Uh, to kill weeds in my lawn, as far as you know. Nailed it. I recommend either running past the guards or killing them, as paying for it still makes you do the same thing you would if you murdered everyone. Unfortunately, some idiot puked in the fuse box and almost blew up the whole factory. Or he didn't, the cutscene glitched. This is what it's supposed to look like. Thanks, Postal 2. I really like this level. It has some interesting platforming and I remember the pipe falling jump scaring me when I was playing for the first time at like 2 am. The crotchy door around is pretty cool too. You need to get the crotchy door, but they are all sold out. There are plenty of Larry's left though. Hey mascot, hey mascot, I need a bad touch crotchy. We be all sold out and shit. Shit. Why don't you buy Larry the Crab? We got lots of those. You can actually trade with crotchy if you still have Gary Coleman's book. How's this sound? You give me that last crotchy doll you've got hidden up your ass, and I'll give you this freshly autographed Gary Coleman book. Bitch, you got yourself a deal. Thanks. Have a crotchy day. There's this YouTube comment under a video of this that explains it quite well. At first glance, Postal 2 looks like a shitty FPS game that tries to be as sexy and shocking as possible in hopes to tear a single laugh from your throat, like Modern Family Guy as a shooter. But through time it reveals that it's actually a really well designed game, that just so happens to try to be as strong as possible to successfully rip a laugh from your throat. If you go and steal it, be sure to pick up these crotchy grenades. You think you can take Crotchy down? Crotchy is invincible to bullets. Sometimes. I still haven't figured it out, but my strategy is to spam rockets at him. Be careful though, the rockets he fires are all heat seeking and he can spam them while you have to wait to charge your shot to fire one. I hope you found a bad touch Crotchy. You won't believe what they're selling for online. Oh, I got a Crotchy alright. <laughs> yep, definitely. Couple of times. Want to see the cool thing I picked up to kill the weeds with? Ow! You ruined my carpet, you asshole! <laughs> Sorry, I was aiming higher, I swear. Gotta get this thing calibrated. Ah, 
can't forget Uncle Dave's birthday. He always throws such excellent parties at the compound. Today's tasks, get an alternator, pick up a package, very funny, and give Uncle Dave a present for his birthday. There is actually a side quest of sorts today. The dude will complain that he needs to take a piss. And if you ever do, you'll discover that you have gonorrhea and you'll have to visit a clinic. Gonorrhea piss means anyone you piss at instantly puke at the cost of taking some damage. You don't have to use the medicine, you just need to get it. So you can keep the gonorrhea piss if you'd like. Screw all that though. I'm gonna take a trip through a tunnel from Paradise, Arizona to Afghanistan. Not kidding by the way, you can get to Tora Bora and fight some terrorists. I still don't know if it's Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, the game seems to use the two interchangeably. I personally go there on Friday to get two overpowered weapons, a WMD which will spread a disease and a literal mini nuke launcher. Be careful though, you look at this map funny and it will crash. Anyways, after getting out and doing the usual things I do daily, I found this chainsaw and I really like it. It uses gasoline as fuel but gasoline is everywhere. I went to get a police uniform and I found both Gary Coleman and Crotchy in a jail cell. And I decided to have a fair rematch. I decided to get my package first and for some reason there are a lot of terrorists in this map that are targeting me and me only. Yeah, fair enough. This mission isn't that interesting. It's near the end of the game so you already experienced enough missions like this and it gets kinda boring. Next I went to the junkyard to get an alternator. You can find a copy of Postal Free there, that's about it. Oh wait, no, a bunch of dogs attack you and if you have a lot of dog treats you can make your own dog army. To get the cure, you need to piss into this giant machine, and if you do it before this day you can get some free crack. The last round is actually pretty good. You rank as a cult leader and you come in mid ATF raid, very similar to the infamous Waco Siege. If you don't have a police uniform, this is pretty hard. After you finish all tasks and walk through a loading zone, instead of getting teleported to the end, you get a special newspaper. Hmm, normally I'd expect a fancy cinematic to explain such a crucial story element. The font is nice though. It's the apocalypse. Everyone is fighting and cats are falling from the sky. The newspaper mentions that the military denies accusations of releasing gas that turns people crazy. I really like the apocalypse. It's a good way to end such a chaotic game and gives you a great opportunity to go postal. According to some old thread I found by a running with scissors employee, apparently Postal 2 was supposed to have a morality system where during the apocalypse certain things would change. Being better to the town would make NPCs help you while being an asshole would make the town even more hostile. Wow, a system that punishes you for going postal in a postal game. That sounds awful and I'm glad it got removed. I'm very happy that it was never attempted again. Once you get back home, the ending place. Honey, I'm home. You won't believe the day I've had. About friggin' time. Did you remember my rocky road? Don't. I unironically love this game to death, from its absurd humor to its great world. I only scratched the surface with this part of the video. There's so much more I could talk about that I could probably make an hour plus long video about all the little details if I wanted to. Was the game somehow not goofy enough for you? Well, now that you beat the game you unlock enhanced mode and a cheat menu. Enhanced mode adds more weapons to the world and makes them way more powerful. No fall damage, fire immunity, different types of peace, etc. The weapons also get a buff. Throw as many machetes as you want, fly with the shovel, shoot the sound of as fast as you can click the shoot button, shoot bouncing cats, find a power infused Gary autobiography, etc. Want to remotely control your rockets? Want to turn every bystander into Gary Coleman? The cheat menu has you covered. Even though I'm a big fan, there are a couple of things I dislike about the game and it wouldn't be fair if I didn't mention them. There's an entire array of the map that's completely useless. Not every map has an errand, but they can at least be used as a path to the ones that do. However, this is a totally pointless loop. The weapons either feel like water guns or absolutely godly. Also, the game is incredibly unstable. It runs on Unreal Engine 2. Beta. I shoot you not, they made this game on a beta version of Unreal Engine 2, which alongside questionable coding makes the game incredibly unstable. It's way better now after years of patches and computers getting more powerful, but it still crashed on me a couple times. The jokes also often don't land. 
I still find a lot of it funny, but it wouldn't be fair if I didn't mention that the humor is incredibly tasteless a lot of the time. Aside from the technical issues and some of the other things I mentioned, I love this game. If I didn't, I wouldn't have spent over 200 hours just in the Steam release. I also love how Running Goose Sisters not only made the game digitally available, but also updated with modern resolutions and FOV slider achievements, new content, Steam Workshop support, weapons supported from some popular mods. They really made sure that the most accessible releases of Postal 2 are the definitive ones by far. There's an important discussion to be had though. Was this game intentionally good? I know this might sound stupid, but a lot of the greatness feels accidental. I don't know how else to describe it, but so many of the Postal games after Postal 2 failed to be even half as good. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is an example of this. Postal 2 Apocalypse Weekend. You might notice that this part of the video is pretty short, and that's because there's not much to talk about. Aside from one small area that you return to a couple of times, there is no open world, just linear missions with every objective being either kill X amount of Y, or just getting to the end of the stage. The plot is entertaining, but the gameplay is boring. I love Postal 2, but gunplay isn't its strong point. Removing almost everything but the gunplay takes the experience from amazing to decent at best and mind-numbingly boring at worst. It's like when I talked about Postal 1, I could have gone through each level one by one explaining each enemy and weapon one by one but none of that really mattered, because you would understand everything just by playing the game. Postal 2 isn't like that since every playthrough is at least somewhat unique, but in Apocalypse Weekend my playthrough is basically your playthrough. I'll still sum up the plot for you because that's the one entertaining part. But aside from that, this expansion is pretty mediocre. Some designer has lost his tiny mind. Apocalypse Weekend starts with a pre-rendered cutscene of all things, which is weird because Postal 2 didn't have a single one. The Postal dude wakes up from a short coma after shooting himself in the head to avoid listening to his wife. I better still have both kidneys, Dr. Mangla. Oh, get well cards. And I've only been here overnight. Let's see. Get well soon, P.S. We're repossessing your trailer, signed Acme Repossessors. Hmm. We hope you'll soon be through this troubled time and back on the road to happiness and health. P.S. Unless you pay your outstanding license fees, Champ will be put to sleep tomorrow night. Love the pound. And last but not least, you should only die. I'm moving back in with Mother, signed your hateful wife. Uh, well, at least the news isn't all bad. He needs to rescue his dog, get his trailer back, and score some cash. He decides to donate his sperm after seeing an ad. After this, the dude starts experiencing hallucinations filled with evil Gary Coleman. Most people I know dislike this part, but I don't mind it. The Coleman are very tanky if you only use the scissors, but you can actually kick back grenades like a parry. If you're playing the A Week in Paradise mode, which combines the base game and this, you'll find all your weapons in the hospital reception. After that, you're put in the only somewhat open part of Paradise, known as Lower Paradise. The dude starts bitching about being very hungry, so you go to the nearest Chinese restaurant. Oh shit, mad cow Tourette zombies. This is the second new enemy type introduced, and is unfortunately way less fun to fight than the Coleman from the hallucinations. To kill a zombie you have to destroy its head, which limits you to using either the hammer, baseball bat or a shotgun. They are not threatening at all, they can melee you and do a small bit of damage, or throw some gibbs which also don't do much damage. These are most of Apocalypse Weekend's issues put into one enemy, not that hard, only one way to beat them and boring to fight. After killing 20 of them you get hired as a municipal mad cow relocation engineer. In practice this is killing X amount of Y by headshots again. This is boring, you literally just did this but with slightly different enemies. After that you get promoted once again. Well done, son. You did so well, I'm promoting you to Chief Pigeon Relocation Engineer. Congratulations, here's your rocket launcher. Don't abuse it now. Time to relocate some pigeons. I told you no. What the hell you think this is? Friggin' bullshit. What do you got, Steve? Hold on, hold on. Proposal what do you got? for the pigeon mission. Proposal for the pigeon mission? We, we ain't got no budget for pigeon missions. The fuck are you kidding me? Vince, the kids. You gotta think of the kids. Look at the quality of this video. You want my luck? Enough! Hold on, I said. Who, what, who is this? You, the, get on fucking line. You want money too. You, fuck you too.
I'd like to add that this mission was at one point a real thing before it got cancelled for whatever reason. Vince Desi then calls you to ask for a favor, going to their old publisher and getting their gold master back. This is a great example of how little choice you get in Apocalypse Weekend. They have metal detectors near the entrance. I threw out every weapon in my inventory but I still got attacked. Remember the whole the game is only as violent as you are which made Postal 2 so interesting to talk about? None of that is in Apocalypse Weekend. You kill their boss and get invited to Vince's house to party with the Postal Babes. I should probably explain that. In universe there is just women supporting the Postal dude and running with scissors, but in real life around the release of Postal 2 running with scissors decided to get stars to advertise their game. I'm not fucking with you, this isn't a bet, this is actually what they did. They haven't made an appearance in years but I don't think anyone is complaining. Either way this is the end of Saturday. Let's see, all I've got is my box of matches and a highly flammable Taliban cellmate. Vince's house has been invaded by zombies and you kill X amount of Y. After that someone offers to pay you if you kill X amount of Y, but this time it's so he can make elephant foot waste baskets. After that Vince calls you again, telling you that Mike G got the matco and asks you to help market their game by getting big media's attention. The dude travels to Al Qaeda to get a bomb, but doesn't find any. Well, this explains things. He gets captured by the military after they think he is also a terrorist, which, to be fair, isn't wrong. You're under arrest. Hey, it's not my fault. Book the kid with the keyboard. But why? I haven't made a single choice so far. This is the most on rails expansion possible, which is extremely disappointing after the amazing base game. You escape their prison and find a nuclear bomb. You can shoot the nuke to get a secret cutscene. That's cool. You do some more platforming and repeat the level again, but this time backwards. You do the publisher mission again, this time starting from a different point even though you enter through the same door, whatever. You set the nook to explode and go recover champ. I tried to befriend the dogs in the pond but there were so many that I decided it would be less bothersome to just kill everyone. After that you cross a bridge filled with zombies and the military and the head wound kicks in one last time. You fight a mad cow Jewish zombie demon Mike J. This boss unlike every other actually requires more than just shooting until it dies. This time you also have to shoot the floating Gary heads for him to be able to take damage until he spawns more. I don't care much for Apocalypse Weekend, it's not bad but it's very boring and it does nothing interesting for 2-3 to three hours. There is no thought here, nothing to discuss, just one boring linear level followed by another, sometimes requiring you to kill X amount of Y to proceed. Unfortunately, this isn't the end of mediocre Postal 2 expansions, any normal reviewer would move on to Postal 3 or Paradise Lost now, but there's another expansion that many are forgetting. In 2005, Akela, running with Scissors Russian publisher, released an expansion made by Avalon Style Entertainment, titled Postal 2 Stopor Zhot, which translates to Corkscrew Rules. It was only available in Russian until they released it as Postal 2 from Russia with Love in Japan, adding a pretty awful English dub by the same Russian actors. <laughs> yeah, right. I can talk. Fuck. What's wrong with my voice? Maybe my balls are asleep or something. How are you, my baby? I'm gonna be entirely honest with you, this game kinda sucks. It does this weird combination of Postal 2's open world and Apocalypse Weekend's linear structure. Let me explain. You have an open world, but you only get one objective at a time, unlocking the next one by completing the last. And to add salt to the wound, these are often on opposite sides of the map. There are some new weapons, a frying pan which is a standard melee weapon, the dirty sock which is just a model swap of the scissors, and a slingshot. To make the game more Russian, crack is replaced with vodka, but it just restores your health to 100, with no overcharge, and doesn't have the withdrawal mechanic which makes it infinitely more boring. The plot revolves around Corkscrew, or Stopor which is the original Russian name, a popular uh, film star 
and how someone stole his member. Through the game you discover that the person responsible for this is Osama Bin Laden. He's going around stealing different organs and body parts in order to replace his own and become the perfect human. I could go more into detail describing each one, but be honest, do you care? Does anyone care about this weird, boring, shitty and funny Russian expansion? Not really. It's more of a curiosity than something that anyone should play. It's a shitty version of Postal 2. If you're curious, you can download it from the Steam Workshop, which changes some mechanics and also adds subtitles. Just be sure to also download the scripts. If you're a Russian, you might get a kick out of it. I know the Russian developer from a couple of videos ago enjoyed it. If you're not Russian, there is not much to see here. For the time being, this is the end of Postal 2. Shame that only the original game is actually good. After the release of Apocalypse Weekend, not much was happening and fans would have to wait for 6 years before they got the third installment, but in the meantime a bunch of other stuff happened. A while after Postal 2's release, a German Postal fan club contacted Uwe Boll, proposing that he should adapt the games into a movie. Now, if you don't know who Uwe Boll is, you should google World Wars Director. That's not a joke, he actually shows up. Not only are his films objectively shit, they're also literally tax shelters. The reason I'm able to do this kind of movies is I have a tax shelter fund in Germany and uh, if you invest in a movie in Germany you get ba basically 50% back from the government and uh, what is interesting for richer people basically uh, to invest in movies because they are covered with 50%. Uwe Boll was intrigued by the game's political incorrectness, so he contacted Vince Desi, who sold them the rights to a movie adaptation. Allegedly, Vince wanted a darker version of the movie, possibly more akin to Postal 1, but that's not what ended up releasing at all. The movie is about how Postal do and Uncle Dave become scalpers, and they try to steal a shipment of crotchy dolls, Chaos and Suze. I'm not gonna talk about the plot in detail, because unlike a game like all the other Postals, there's nothing to be enjoyed here but the plot. So I won't spoil it. I can talk about games all day, gameplay elements, technical details, but that's not the case with such a simple movie so I won't go into detail. But what I can tell you is that the movie is objectively pretty bad. Because you know, there are all the rumors out that my movies are financed with gold, and what should I say? It's true. But somebody must do something with the money. Do you know that my father died in Auschwitz? My grandpa died also in Auschwitz. He fell from a watchtower. I get a little horny here on stage sometimes. If you see the crowd and all the children. Are you fucking kidding me? But something in my monkey brain enjoys it. Around the same time, Running With Scissors released an album, Music To Go Postal By, featuring indie music by a bunch of different artists. There's not much to say about it. It's free on wherever people listen to music nowadays. Back in 2009, two licensed postal mobile games for Java phones came out. One just titled Postal, which I'll call Postal Mobile to avoid confusion, by Ministry of Fun and K-Tai Toys, and Postal Babes by Herocraft. Postal Babes came out in February and I don't have much to say about it aside from that I could barely get it to run. I tried every reputable Java emulator and every version of those I can find, but every single one had bigger or lesser issues. After all, that was it worth it? Not really. The game is just a pretty mediocre beat em up. And if not for the fact that the game has postal in the name and that the loading screen sees the running of scissors logo, I would have never guessed that this is related to postal. Not really worth the effort. The other game, which I'll call Postal Mobile, is actually pretty decent. It's a top down shooter kinda like Postal 1 but with a more light hearted plot, kinda like Postal 2. Your car gets stolen by a bunch of fags and you need to get it back. In the process you end up discovering the mayor's corruption and with this info, you trick a TV crew into thinking they're gonna expose the mayor, but the dude just announces that he is missing his car and that he has a reward for whoever finds it. There's not much to it. It's a simple short mobile shooter and not a bad one at that. Its only major flow is that most of the gunfights can be won by holding the fire button right after any cutscene. I really dig the art style, especially the pixel postal dude in the HUD. You can also unlock perks and use two at any time. Time. They're an interesting idea so I wanted to mention them. Is there literally anything else I could talk about? No? Alright, fine. Around 2006, Running of Scissors wanted to make a new postal. They wanted to make it big and good and cool, but they didn't have the resources, so they licensed Akela, remember them, to make it. They co-developed the game with Trashmasters. The development was going smoothly for the first couple years. It was meant to release in 2008, but it got delayed a couple times. But all in all, it was looking pretty good. Then this little quirky thing called the 2008 Global Economic Meltdown happened, which hit Russia pretty hard. Akela made a bunch of bad decisions. They fired the first 
team that worked on the game, commonly referred to as the A team, which meant that the game was given to the much smaller and less experienced team, known as the B team, which was also fired and the game was stuck in limbo until around 2010. Then they got another team to work on the game known as the C team, and can you guess what happened to them? So then the game was finished by a D team in 2011. They also made a couple patches before getting fired and I can't find any info to confirm this, but apparently they didn't even get paid. All of this chaos caused the game to stray from Running of Scissors' original vision. The game ended up using linear maps like Apocalypse Weekend, due to difficulties with getting the Source engine to stream the world correctly. The game was nowhere near finished when it shipped. It was pushed out early by Akela in an attempt to stop bleeding money. This is the one time that both critics and fans agree. This game sucks shit. This is one of the worst games I have ever played and I'm not exaggerating. This game fails at almost everything and I would rather watch Paint Dry than play it. Literally nothing in this game works properly, not even the performance. Some dumbass made the game single threaded by default, and if you don't know what that means, it limits the game to using only one CPU thread which makes the game run a lot worse than it would if it were multi-threaded. Let's start from the beginning. The game starts with a message and memory of champ, then you get a more or less accurate recap of Postal 2 and Apocalypse Weekend, and then you start on the same bridge from the end of Apocalypse Weekend. Why are you back here? Who knows. This serves as the tutorial and as a warning to how little of this game works and how even less is actually fun. The game is now in third person and you have a cover system alongside regenerating health vehicles, although they're not in the tutorial and you can only ride segways, and all that modern third person shooter bullshit. You learn how to throw grenades, which is the one thing that isn't a total downgrade. I still prefer two system of allowing you to control the distance, but this is pretty decent too. Lay down gasoline, which barely works, etc. After that you're in a new town, Catharsis. Your main goal through the games to get cash to get fuel, so you can get out of the town. But you just picked up gasoline, and there's gasoline lying all over the place. This is such an obvious thing, I have no idea how they missed this. Either way, you're hired by Ron Jeremy to clean cam rugs. If you think this is unfunny, then don't expect to find anything funny, because this is about as funny as it gets. The reason why, in my opinion, Postal do this comedy well is that a lot of it isn't in your face, but on things like billboards and whiteboards and other types of boards. The point being that it's not in your face, so unfunny jokes don't feel like wasted space. However, in Postal 3, most jokes are in cutscenes that you have to watch to understand what's happening. This makes the unfunny jokes, so most of them, feel way more unfunny than if they just were somewhere that you can ignore. After some time, hockey moms attack and you have to throw cameras at them to scare them off. But since they scared away all of the customers, instead of getting paid you get to keep the vacuum, which is basically a useless joke weapon. After that you do some more unfunny boring missions, whatever. Almost all of the missions are kill X amount of Y. Again, just like in Apocalypse Weekend. After doing two or three boring missions, you get to choose between helping the police or helping a bunch of robbers. And then Crochi comes to introduce the karma system. Basically, for killing innocents you lose karma, change from the good path to the insane path, and after doing the insane path you get the bad ending. Yes, a postal game punishes you for going postal. This is such a stupid idea that I refuse to believe that anyone on any of the three teams thought this was a good idea. And the good path? The dude joins the police force. The first mission teaches you how to arrest people. Then it turns into an escort mission where you have to get this cop through the police station while it's being attacked. The AI in this game is absolute dog shit and after like 5 different attempts which ended the mission breaking, I literally had to teleport the cop to the end using console commands. After that you're dropped into a small free roam area where you have to arrest a couple people. The mission is boring and repetitive, moving on. After that you have to defend Uwe Ball from a bunch of nerds which, if Uwe Ball is fine with beating his critics in boxing matches, it should be fair game to allow Uwe to also fight the darts himself. I'm the only genius in the whole fucking business. I could go on like this, but I don't think anyone cares. It's all kill like some amount of why. And it doesn't matter for reasons you'll know soon enough. The most interesting thing that happens after this is that the dude joins SWAT and fights ecologists. Near the end a chaotic fight starts between the mayor, who is also Ron Jeremy, Osama and Uncle Dave, who only now appears he was absent for the rest of the game. After that another apocalypse starts and you have to escape Kafarsis, ending with a boss fight to destroy a tank controlled by the Venezuelan army. Oh yeah, they also only now appeared into the plot. If you didn't kill anyone, you get an ending where the dude becomes a celebrity. But if you kill at least one person, the dude becomes the president. Of course, ending in him once again detonating a nuke. Hey, Vice President Champ. What do you got, boy? No way! I thought that thing only existed in Bugs Bunny cartoons. <laughs> What's so funny? I will regret nothing. 
The insane buff is slightly more interesting. Instead of becoming a cop, the dude works for random people in search of money. Of course, it reuses a lot of the other buff, but instead of killing X amount of Y, you kill X amount of Z. There are some interesting moments, like when the dude once again kills Crotchy but this time steals his suit. The only actual change this brings is that you can't take over or sprint. The ending shows the dude escaping a farces, but this time you get out of there without doing anything. Dave, Osama and Demir get attacked and killed by hockey moms. The game tells you to play the good path to get any actual ending, the dude gets the death penalty and gets sent to hell. The dude survived shooting himself in the head, two apocalypses and a nook and yet he is captured and killed, alright. All of the weapons suck, aside from the M16, that one looks good, sounds powerful and is somewhat accurate while doing a decent amount of damage. Every melee weapon has awful hit detection, the gasoline is so tedious to use that you might as well not bother, the kick has a wind up and feels awful, pacing isn't fun anymore. The M16 is literally the only weapon that isn't absolute garbage and since so many NPCs have it you're constantly getting ammo for it. The game barely works, it crashed at least 15 times for me. I ran into a lot of glitches, including soft locks, and there's even a part where the cutscene from the opposite path plays, only confusing the player. Not amusingly, the lieutenant was furious about all the friendly fire and threw me off the force. My police career ended before it even began. So there I was, my first day of serving and protecting. Yep, I was... You probably noticed that the dude sounds different. Rick Hunter was going through a breakup, so they got his friend, Cory Cruz, to do the voice in Postal Free. Cory is one of the only good things about the game. His voice sounds different from Rick Hunter, but it still fits the character. It's just a shame that this is the first Postal he was in. If Postal 2 is a satire of mid-2000s America, then Postal 3 is the satire of the concept of fun. There is literally no way to describe how bad this game feels to play. The only possible way for you to understand how bad it is, is if you actually try to play it, which, please don't. The gameplay sucks, the story is boring, the jokes aren't funny, and there's not much of a reason to play it. The reason why I love Postal 1 and 2 isn't just because they are great games, but because there's nothing like them. There are so many isometric shooters, but none of them are quite like Postal. And there's literally no game even somewhat similar to Postal 2. There are way too many mediocre third-person shooters, so it's not even like Postal 3 fits some niche. The only good things in the game is some of the music and Cory Cruz's voice. Some of the levels are competently designed, but not most. I could say more about the game, but everything that could be said about the game has already been said a million times, by both Postal fans and the general public. Whatever you do, don't play this game. For a while after the release, running with scissors, who tried to get the shit train to stop but are not blameless, because while clearly Postal 3 wasn't what they wanted, they were still responsible for the comedy which falls flat 99% of the time, tried to calm the storm in the fanbase, but eventually after Akala refused to provide the source code, which is apparently in Russian, and or patch the game, they stopped trying, stopped selling the game on their website, and released a statement on their page. Even after this, a lot of people lost their goodwill towards running with scissors, and they knew that they have to do something and do it fast. They tried to get Postal 2 on Steam for a while, but then Valve launched Greenlight, which, if you don't know, allowed people to vote on which indie games should be allowed to be sold on Steam. Postal 2 quickly gathered enough votes and eventually released on Steam with many enhancements. Around this time, a novel was released, Postal Special Delivery, by Alisa Bogodarova. It sucks and there's a Game Award 3 pages in. There were two other novels, but they were only available in Russian. Moving on. After releasing and updating Postal 2 on Steam, they did probably the best thing they could do with their resources at the time, released a new Postal 2 expansion. This isn't a new Apocalypse Weekend style boring corridor shooter, but essentially an entire sequel to Postal 2, titled Paradise Lost, and I'm happy to say that they delivered. Paradise Lost takes place in, well, can you guess? And it's really cool to see how the town adapted to getting nuked. The expansion doubles down on the whole, the game is only as violent as you are, thing. Not only are there more pacifist weapons like the beanbag launcher and the flash grenade, but all of the bosses have pacifist solutions to them, including the final boss. Speaking of new weapons, they are pretty good. The most notable ones, in my opinion, being the lever action shotgun and the revolver. The lever action has a great animation and a smaller spread than the normal shotgun at the cost of not being able to silence it with a cut. It's cool but there's not much purpose for it, considering that you can get the sound of as early as Tuesday. The revolver is amazing, killing people with it fills the execution meter. Hold right click to target people, each person taking away a bit of the meter. 
When you release hold fire, the dude will automatically headshot everyone pretty fast. There are also vending machines, most of Paradise sellers have been replaced with them. There are two types, one that sells weapons and ammunition, and one that sells crack, medkits and similar things. You can still buy things from people, even a bunch of retro memorabilia, like corridors, which aren't normally obtainable in this campaign. This is a small detail, but I love that people are selling old shit. It takes place 11 years after Postal 2 after all. Another new addition is Habib's Power Station, an energy drink that allows you to dual wield weapons. You can't dual wield things like the Sound of, melee weapons and throwables, but almost everything aside from that is fair game. Since the Sound of doesn't knock bosses now, dual wielding MP5s is the best way to deal a lot of damage quickly. Paradise Lost is the perfect DLC. It takes everything that made the base game great and expands on it, while negating its downsides. Since it uses mostly the same map as Postal 2, although with a new coat of paint and different things hidden around. It's both a sequel and a remix of sorts, once again reminding me of Pathologic and Pathologic 2. The story is pretty entertaining too. <sighs> Guess it's back to the old grind. Paradise Lost begins with a cool stylized intro showing the ending of Apocalypse Weekend. Champ jumps out of the car and runs after the cat, causing the dude to chase him. His head wound kicks in and he enters a coma. During the 11 year old coma, he imagines a horrible future. He eventually wakes up after being found by a random person, gets a piece of map from him and sets out to find Champ. Your first tasks are to ask people if they know where Champ could be, to check the local shelter and to get something to eat. You start in the train yard area near the church. A thing not a lot of people know is that a photo of Dude and Champ is actually based on a real photo of Vince and Champ. The mission is pretty similar to the petition mission from the base game, but instead of having a random chance to get a signature, you just have to ask a certain amount of people. By any chance, is the dog in this photo familiar to you? It would probably help if I asked someone else. Hi there, have you seen this adorable pooch recently? The horror! Ah! Hmm, that was odd. Guess I need to keep asking around. After a lot of people scream and run away, you're told to speak to the wise man. The next one on the list is checking animal control. The head wound won't kick in like it did in Apocalypse Weekend. Here it has an entirely different use. Welcome to Creature Control Center and Pets. What can I do for you? Yeah, I'm searching for a herd of ostriches. Been missing for about 17 years. <clears throat> no, that's not it. I've been searching for my lost dog. Every once in a while, a voice in your head will comment on what's going on. Initially, this one is pretty boring, but then you find something amazing. Lobotomy monkeys. Speaking of cool things, if you jump through some vents, you encounter velociraptors and a beta shotgun. For the wood mission, you need to visit the newly reopened Caucasian. Luckily, Champ isn't here, but the restaurant does get attacked by some pretty large dogs, which sometimes are hostile and sometimes aren't. Something interesting to note that isn't related to any runs is that the jail has moved. Now Lowman use the basement in the hall. There you can find the Lowman traps. It's just a police uniform but reskinned. It does make you look like a cowboy, so it's an objective improvement. Once you find the wise man in the building Granuk with Scissors used to reside in, he gives some exposition on the current state of paradise and where the dude can find Chomp. Bitch, you're not just talking to a wise man, you're talking to the wise wang. To some of the 3 minute long movie Crotchy shows you, 11 years ago a nuclear bomb was detonated in paradise for unknown reasons. The radioactive fallout split paradise into 4 distinct weather zones. The closer to the site of the blast, the more dangerous. Near the time of the explosion, a dog came into the town, and as he ventured deeper and deeper he got mutated into a giant beast. The dog, dubbed El Perro Loco, terrorized the locals for years, after which he returned to Ground Zero, where the people sealed him off in a so-called hellhole, which makes no sense because the nuke was detonated at the publishing company, not where the dude used to live. If the dude wants to find El Perro Loco, he will have to get to the heart of the town and penetrate the seal, but he won't be able to do it alone, so he must seek help from the different factions that have formed since the explosion. Before letting you go, Crotch warns you about something. But before you go, heed this word of warning, a dark side I sense in you, Beware for this sinister force lies inside your very mind, growing more and more powerful by the day. And with those final words, I must leave you. Saganara, bitch. <laughs> A dark force growing inside my mind? What the hell was he talking about? <coughs> I feel perfectly fine. Yep. Not feeling a single thing out of the ordinary here. <coughs> right. After more or less doing what he needed to do, the dude returns to the train yard and meets some familiar faces. Great, these guys again. No fucking way, you pieces of shit. Not while I'm around. Vince? Hey, dude, it's been a while. Where you been these past few years? Just resting, but now I'm in the process of finding my lost dog, Champ. 
Don't suppose you'd be willing to lend a hand? Listen, man, I'd love to help, but nothing's free. Tell you what, I've got some action I could throw you away. Take care of this for me, and I'll see what I can do. Come on, I'll tell you all about it at my church. Wait, you have a church? Maybe the ball sack was right after all. Vince takes the dude to his new church and promises that he knows how to find Champ. But first we need to do him a couple favors. We need to get some toilet paper, deliver their new game to the arcade and get rid of a competing studio. Since the game takes place in America and all of the rents could result in getting shot, I decided to get a uniform before doing anything else. Oh, this is a cool change, forcing you to actually explore instead of beelining to the locker room. I enjoy the arcade around. You can choose to forcefully install the game on the arcades or you can help the owner in his little side business of illegal weapon trafficking. He also has some hidden gold in his office, which in true video game fashion converts to dollars when you pick it up. The toilet paper is located in the second nuclear zone which unlocked today. Honestly, I didn't expect them to reference the toilet paper shortage panic of 2020. Wait, when did this release again? Oh shit. You can actually buy it after a couple convenient price increases, but no one does that. One nice way to earn money is to sell cuts at the new cash for cuts vendors. Since the Steam release introduced two new shotguns and one more machine gun, which are way better than the base counterparts, cuts did feel pretty useless. And this is a nice way to counter that. Vince's competition, PO Games, recited what used to be the bank. While they are a full scummy greedy developers, they do have some revolutionary ideas. What? What's going on out there? I'll kill you! This is the first of many boss fights in Paradise Lost. Due to how their arenas are designed, each one feels unique. Never mind. To find and cure champ, that one single secret you need to know is... What the... Oh shit! These zombie assholes are breaking in from the fucking cemetery! Remember, to take these guys out, you gotta go for the head. Speaking of getting head, how's it going? Ah! Oh, great. Now my day is complete. Nothing personal, man. But you're fired from life. The running with scissors to just overrun with zombies before Vince can tell us the secret of finding and curing Trump. I really like the escape sequence. It's not something that you expect to happen after completing all tasks. It genuinely caught me off guard. And I enjoy having these escape sequences after each day. <laughs> we are triumphant over the zombie oppressor Vince and his clan. And who do we have here? Uh, don't mind me. I'm just passing through. Holy me! It's the dude! Vince's second in command! You're the tyrant who exterminated so many of our kind and whipped my ass 11 years ago. Quick, my minions, take him prisoner. Oops. We have some unfinished business to take care of. You're gonna be spending the night in the junkyard. Wait, wasn't Matko Mike J just an illusion caused by the head wound? Excuse me, can you spare some cash for this slightly suspect charity I'm collecting for? The dude gets captured by Matko Mike J, which is bullshit, I totally could have taken him on. He's getting married and promises to free you if you help him with his wedding. You need to collect some charity money, get an oversized breast pump and find free AC parts. Since you're helping Mike J, for the time being, zombies aren't hostile. The first AC part is in this very junkyard, so go collect that first. The second one you can buy at the train yard or steal and attract like every lawman in town. And the last one is at the asylum. You have to go through all three buildings, since the level designers are assholes and it spawns in the one you look in last. In case you don't recognize this guy, this is John from Eternal Damnation. The charity money is very similar to the petition mission from the base postal 2, except that you don't actually have to do it. Right as you exit the junkyard, the voice in your head points out the giant sign advertising that Zack Ward is in town. And both the dude and the voice in your head will shit talk you into going to Zack Ward and asking him to give you some of his royalties. Zack Ward and his ginger gang resides where the police station used to be, in the part of town that unlocks today. This is probably my favorite area, but that might be because I usually love wonder levels in games. Zack Ward is the first actual boss fight and a pretty good one at that. Aside from just fighting him, you'll get attacked by gingers from the higher parts of the arena, while you and Zack battle on the lower part. 
The last errand I did was getting the breast pumps. You can get one from a suspicious farmer in exchange for milking some cows. To milk a cow approaches from the back and start milking. If the cow isn't complying, blow its head off. Apparently, even though I nuked the town, the zombie cows are still alive. You can milk them too, no one will notice. After completing all the tasks for Mike, the dog comes back to the junkyard and we finally get to know who he is marrying. Hey, that's my home. But who would want to live in my shitty trailer aside from me and my ex Y? Uh-oh. Oh my god, it's my hateful ex-wife, and she's... thin. That's right! I was able to lose the pounds after I left your sorry ass. How dare you come here on this beautiful day? I'll teach you to show your face again! All this fighting is making my nipples hard! I really like this boss fight, it's very fun. There is no way to skip this mission, but there is a way to beat it without killing the bitch, which is her canon name. Get her to run into the giant cakes to return her to her former form. I'm just fine with that. Luckily for you, you won't have to search for the next clan for long. You speak of the legendary El Perro Loco? He wishes to cure the beast of his colossal form. To take what is big and make it small. He must be one of us. We have misjudged you, tall one. Clearly one who wishes to shrink what is large thinks as we do. Come with us. At dawn tomorrow, you shall meet with our leader who is sure to lend his aid in your quest. Quick, bring him to the coal mine. Hi there, I'm in the market for some noxious, unregulated chemicals. The dude decides to follow the Coleman, a faction run by Gary. Of course, since this came out in 2015, they couldn't get Gary to voice himself, so he's constantly carried by Big Mick Willis, who also speaks for him. Apparently, Gary and his tribe want to rise up against tall people, and promises that if the dude helps, they will make a cure for Trump. You need to get chemicals for the cure, get stilts for them, and ruin a karaoke night. The stilts are the closest, and getting them is my favorite errand of the day. The people that have the stilts are creating a new model of the Venda Cure robot. This time, it can move and talk. After the same thing that this is gross, they just like Coleman decide to rise up. You can either shoot the robots, which is lame, or you can piss in them for a couple seconds, which rewards you with an item alongside disabling the robot. The dude can piss for a long time, but even he has a limit. So remember to stock up on the water bottles, which instantly fill up your bladder. I wish that the robots could have a couple more lines as their dialogue gets very repetitive. Next, I want to get the chemicals. The rednecks seem to be the only group that hasn't moved. They still reside in the same area where they kidnapped you 11 years ago. After getting the chemicals, the dude gets robbed so you get a four variant, which is to get your shit back. Since it was partially along the way, I went to ruin the karaoke night in the last unlockable part of town. The closest to where the dude used to live, and where the hellhole seal is located. To ruin the karaoke, you can wreck the place, or you can do something much worse. Oops, I nuked you again. I pressed the button. Wiped out society. It's getting radioactive in here, so put on your hazmat suit. This might be the only errand in the whole franchise where the pacifist route causes more pain. The bandits reside at what used to be the post office. You get your stuff back bit by bit here, like how you did after becoming a gimp in the base game. This was supposed to be a boss fight, but the revolver execution one-shots him. You can actually use his minigun turret after killing him. Imagine if you could take it off and carry it around with you like in Serious Sam 3. That would be awesome. After an entire day of mostly recycled but still very fun missions, the dude returns to the Coleman and gets his cure. But it would be stupid to go without testing it. This is the first escape part and by now it starts to feel a bit repetitive. I don't know why I don't enjoy this one as much as the others, but the minecart ride right, is pretty cool and full of memorable moments. The last group that's going to help you is definitely an unexpected ally, but we could all use some terrorism from time to time. Please, put down your weapon. I mean you no harm. You are free to be mistaken, as Al-Qaeda is a peace-loving group, loving about races and creeds. We only wish to support our fellow men in the times of need. <laughs> Oh, my head wound. I see you are truly one in need of help. Come with me, friend. 
for you are in no state to brave the night on your own, and Kaira shall accommodate you until you are feeling better. I think the best choice would be to get my ass out of here before somebody shoots it off. just another horrible dream. Wait a second, my head wound. It's not hurting anymore. Shit, that's a relief. Maybe things are finally starting to look up. Morning, sunshine. Gah, who the hell are you? My evil twin? I'm you, genius. The alternate dude, just like you, has the goal of finding Trump. Also, in case you didn't notice, he's voiced by Cory Cruz. Bin Laden promises to help you open the seal to the hellhole. Your tasks are to get C4, get a blasting cap and do a favor to a friend of Al-Qaeda. You can get the blasting cap from Lucky Ganesh. I didn't pay Habib $5 for the milk back 11 years ago and he expects me to pay $500 for a blasting cap? It doesn't matter if you pay or not, the alternate dude opens a way out for you, which is through the underground filled with angry games. The personal favor happens to be for Uncle Dave. His cult fell off so he moved on to smoking a shitload of weed. You get this neat weapon from pruning the hairs and a radio for the duration of the mission, which allows you to somewhat control Uncle Dave. There's not much to this mission, aside from the feds being feds. Then I went to get the C4. The alternate dude was way ahead of you, and already alerted every survivalist within the map, including this one really annoying asshole who spams homing rockets. Fortunately, the exit is very close to where the C4 is placed, so at least you don't have to backtrack through this whole real near path. The alternate dude also beat you to detonating the seal to the hell hole, so you have a spare bomb. Welcome to literal hell, filled with zombies, lava, crash bandicoot bridges, Gary Coleman spirit and screams of the damned. You get to restock before going to get champ. I enjoyed the champ fight. You have to lower his health and inject the cure into him to make him smaller. Champ, you're okay. Here, champ. Come on, boy. Hey, pal, what do you think you're doing? I'm here to take possession of my beloved canine champ. I appreciate your help, but your services will no longer be needed. Now, if you don't mind, I'll be taking my dog and leaving now. Your dog? He's my dog. No, he's my dog. 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 He's my dog! What do you think you're doing here? I don't remember giving you custody of the dog. Actually, dear, I don't think we ever got that divorce. Hmm, <laughs> that's right. In that case, until death do us part. You also have to fight the bitch again. At least it's a new fight and not the one from Wednesday reused. Instead of injecting her to make her very small, Mike J fills her with... Don't think about it. Whoa! Whoa! Damn! Well, I was just using you for the sweet loving! Screw you, bitch! I'm out of here! Well, I guess that's the end of that chapter. Ah! Hmm, so that was really something. Well, good luck in your attempt to rescue your dog. I thought he was your dog. Are you crazy enough to follow the bitch into that? Just for a dog, watch me. The alternate dude, coming from a game of no joy, clearly doesn't understand the bond a man has with his dog. Also, there were several missions in Postal 3 where you rescue champ. Either way, you get to restock again and have one final fight with the bitch, who is now only slightly fatter than she was before. I remember on Reels of Paradise Lost, this boss fight was way, way junkier, and borderline broken but it works fine now. It's not that hard of a boss fight but again, is there any difficult boss fight in Postal? If you didn't finish the fight in the pacifist way, the bitch will start shit talking you after defeating her. You I wouldn't have expected that coming from you. I suppose I appreciate your help back there. It's no problem. In retrospect, I think we may have a bit more in common than you think. Well, maybe there's some good in that twisted mind of yours after all. <laughs> Thanks. Trust me, it was no trouble at all. I regret nothing.
neither do I. I originally had a big part of the script dedicated to theories about the alternate dude and how Matka Omaj is suddenly real, but I think it's easier to say that the writers didn't really care. I'm glad that Cory Cruz got to play the postal dude in a game that doesn't suck. You get the choice, you can either take revenge on every faction leader for what they did to you, or you can just get the fuck out of here. It was never explained which ending is canon, so I'll show both of them. The escape ending features the dude and champ getting out of the town and Paradise getting nuked again. By who? No idea, maybe it was the alternate dude. You get the other ending by killing Zack Ward, who claims to be the one real postal dude, Gary Coleman who is now on stills, Vince Desi, who for whatever reason isn't a zombie anymore, Matt Cow Mike J, who now doesn't get destroyed by 7 sound of shots, and Osama who doesn't do anything interesting. My favorite thing to do to Gary is to inject him with my cure a couple times to make him even smaller than before. None of the boss fights are that interesting. They're all basically the same, aside from Matt Cow Mike J who is raised from Apocalypse Weekend. If you decide to defeat all the faction leaders, you become known as the Postal God. And so, with the defeat of the last faction leader, the last obstacle standing before the Postal Dude fell. With none left to oppose him, he would become the ruler supreme of this lost paradise. He was no longer a mere man or dude, for he was forever to be revered in the eyes of the people as the Postal God. And that, kiddies, concludes our tale. Tune in next week, same time, same place, for the continuing adventures in the life of the Postal Dude. And remember, whatever you do, have no regrets. <laughs>
There were also changes made to the campaign. There are some gameplay changes like changing the spawn locations for every level to make them connect to each other better, but the most important changes are the ones to the story. If you play on Hard or Above, the normal loading screen messages get replaced by the diary and the war journal from the post one manual. There is also a new level, the Carnival, it has clowns, it's funny. A way more significant change is the new ending, the school one being replaced because it was mostly used for shock value and, according to Running with Scissors themselves by 2016, school you know what, have lost its shock value due to becoming very common which is depressing as fuck. The new ending features the dude arriving at a church, walking through a long lane and seeing a funeral with only the priest attending, after which he falls to the ground. If you finish the game on hard, you can also see a man who looks similar to the dude and a woman next to the grave as it gets lowered. I strongly prefer this ending to the original. It could be showing the aftermath of the dude's massacre, getting buried alone, with no one even attending his funeral, unloved. There's a theory that the dude in Postal 1 is actually the father of the dude from the rest of the franchise. People suggest that the grave is lowered is actually the same grave as the one that you have to piss on in Postal 2. To sum it up, Redux is an incredible remake, though it feels more arcadey compared to the serious tone of the original. I recommend it to everyone. It's the only postal game that released on consoles like the Switch and PlayStation. No Xbox though, because it keeps getting rejected by Microsoft. On October 14th, 2019, Running with Scissors did something weird. They announced Postal 4, no regards, out of nowhere and instantly released it into early access to obtain funding to finish the game. You see, despite Postal being a cult classic, the games don't actually sell that well. Postal 1 is free, 2 sells great but it goes on sale for a dollar a lot, and according to Mike J, Redux didn't sell well. And they still haven't run out of 20th anniversary editions released in 2017. They needed money, so they pushed out an extremely early version of Postal 4, no regards, onto Steam in a self-proclaimed junkie alpha. Now, over two years later on the 20th of April 2022, the game came out of early access. Hey, editing portal here. Sorry to pause the video for a second, but I have something important to say. This footage was recorded on game version 1.0.4, released April 23rd. The game received quite a few updates since then, now we're on 1.1.0, which released about two and a half weeks before the release of this video. Some important stuff has changed, some stuff was added, some was altered, but most importantly they fixed the performance. To put it lightly, before 1.0.10 the game ran like shit, and that's the footage you're gonna see. Why? Because I don't have the time to re-record the entire game, making sure to caption every little thing I mention, and then re-edit the next half an hour of video because contrary to what you might think, I have an actual life. Also, I try my best to make sure every flow I mention is still present in the current release, but a few might have slipped past me. Still, if something is significant enough that I mention it, it shouldn't have made it into the fifth full release version. Anyway, sorry, back to the video. Before you start the game, you get to choose who do you want to voice the dude. Your choices are Rick Hunter, Cory Cruz, Zack Ward and John St. John, the voice of Big Decat from Sonic Adventure. Oh, and also Duke Nukem. I'm gonna choose John St. John, because his voice has been in the game since the first early access release. After a really short recap of what happened in the previous games, the dude gets his trailer stolen, and left with only a bathrobe, a bit of cash and champ, the dude visits the nearby town of Edenson, hoping to find a new job on his stolen possessions. Yeah, my wallet's feeling a little light right now, wherever it might be at the moment. In the first area, you'll find some basic gear, a piece of cardboard, and a pen. After choosing your beggar message, a nearby gate opens, and you're off to explore Edenson, asking people for work. Hey, one percenter, how about giving an eager 99 percenter like me a chance, huh? I know where you can find a job. Up your ass. Rats. Pretty close to the gate you can find a rampage. These are optional challenges, challenging the player to do X amount of Y. Each one rewards you with something, from money to more interesting things like a new path robe. You can find over 150 dolls all around the map, and you can get some cosmetics for obtaining them all alongside a bit of cash. Speaking of cosmetics, you can change how your HUD looks, change weapon skins, even how your cock sensor bar looks. Also, you might have noticed that I don't have subtitles enabled like I did in Postal 2, and that's because they barely work here. You're eventually directed to the job agency, but to get there you need to pass through a loading zone. That's right, instead of streaming the world like every competent open world game since 2005, this game uses loading zones. 
This wouldn't be that big of a deal if the loading didn't take ages, even on an SSD. In Edenson there are also scooters, which aren't that much faster than running. Once you get to the job agency, you're given three jobs, becoming a sewer worker, animal catcher and a prison guard. The prison is pretty close so I did that one first. You're tasked with inputting codes into keypads. You're given a reset code, 696, but the person talking to you was holding the sheet upside down. The sheet had the code that would release every prisoner, 969. Somehow, inputting 696 also releases everyone. If you input 969, everyone gets released, which makes sense, but 696 doing it makes absolutely no sense. Aside from that, it's a pretty decent mission. The animal catcher is boring and sucks. You're tasked with delivering free cats and free dogs. They can be either dead or alive. You're given a lot of catnip that you should never use to catch cats and a lot of dog treats. Cats in this game behave weird. Cats don't explode anymore. A real shame since that was one of my favorite postal 2 details. As a consequence, nothing is stopping you from reusing the same cut over and over. Pretty close to the animal catcher errand, a fire broke out at the fire station. There are a couple side errands throughout the game that you can do. None of them are worth doing besides stealing art. Last and probably least, the sewer worker. This is a couple boring missions smashed into one, as you'll have to replace light bulbs, drain the sewer, and shovel big piles of shit. Get it? It's funny, because it's a giant pile of shit. The sewer looks really good compared to the rest of the game. Can you guess why it looks so good, aside from it actually using lighting? That's because a lot of the assets are straight up bought from the Unreal Engine asset store instead of being original. There is nothing wrong with buying assets, but the contrast between the areas designed by Rango of Scissors and the store bought ones is very drastic. After that, instead of getting teleported to the end like in Postal 2, you can still explore the world. But if you prefer how it was in the previous games, you get a button to skip to the end. Hey, how about some service here? Ah, our esteemed guest has arrived. Forgive my absence, but your job recruiter has booked you into the deluxe suite, and we were busy preparing your five-star experience. Have a good night's rest, fellas. And, oh, don't let the alley rats bite. Crap. If you don't hurry up, I'm gonna start listening to one of the other voices in my head. Two jobs, easy enough. Pay for the parking ticket and meet an associate of the job agency guy. The parking fine is actually the best mission so far, since it actually allows you to complete it in multiple ways. You can do it by finding cars with expired parkometers next to them, you can kick the parkometers so they become expired, or you can ignore that and throw the ticket into the box which triggers an alarm. If you do the last one, you'll probably die, and then you'll notice something weird. Instead of loading the most recent save when you die like every normal game in the past 20 years, you'll respawn. The enemies that you killed stay dead most of the time, and you don't get back any ammunition or items that you used since the last checkpoint. This effectively gives you infinite lives, making the game incredibly easy. To meet the associate you have to use the new fast travel system. Can't have too many good things though, this cutscene glitched. This is how it's supposed to look. It's fixed now, but I'm keeping the bugs in the video to show what Rango Scissors considers a release worthy of not only 1.0, but 1.0.4. After the Mexican LARPer gives you a new list of tasks, you respond to do the Mexico area. This place is just pathetic. You have this huge house, but it's so empty. Almost no items, almost no people inside, it's so... Dead. This is one of the biggest issues of Postal 4, the world is lifeless. Many houses either don't have anything inside or are literally empty. In Postal 2 if you enter someone's house they will tell you to get out, then either attack you or run to the nearest police officer. Here, most of the time nothing happens except for a couple houses where the NPCs reuse Postal 2 voice clips telling you to get out, but that's it. No running, no attacking, nothing. Since I'm complaining, might I mention Edenson's size? It's way too big. With Paradise, you could get from one end of the map to the other in only a couple minutes. The walk was short enough that it wasn't a big deal if you had to travel from one end of the map to the other, but long enough that you're likely to get bored and start causing mayhem. Here, when I have to travel to the other end, I consider uninstalling the game. It doesn't help that a lot of the map is boring. Most areas in Paradise were unique. The bank district is completely different from the suburbs, which are completely different from the industrial zone, etc. But here everywhere feels the same. Yeah, the industrial area looks different to the old deconstruction, but places that should be fairly unique like Mexico really aren't. Postal 4 also lacks atmosphere. Postal 2 had a great atmosphere with the slightly orange apocalyptic lighting and ambience reused from Postal 1. But Postal 4 looks like a cartoon that would get cancelled after a single season. 
Coming back to the runs, the first one I did for the LARPer was smuggling immigrants past a border using a slingshot. If the patrolling guards see the flying immigrants a huge fight will break out. You can shoot at this pile of exploding barrels which is honestly kinda awesome. Today you can also participate in this very, very exciting scooter race. For the attack turf mission, we have to spray over graffiti made by one of the gangs, hopefully creating a war between them and the other gang. The locals don't mind, but a bunch of Twitter users do. Last and certainly not least, you have to deliver a package to a pet store. After leaving the package in the Breaking Bad meth lab, you're knocked out from inhaling the fumes. Well, it looks like it's the start of a brand new day. May as well get to work on those errands. As cat dude you have a couple short tasks, getting pussy, bullying a dog and getting milk. Getting pussy is easy enough, but the other cats that attack you don't have a death animation so they just disappear. Great game guys. To bully the dog either fight the dog yourself or piss in his bowl. As for the milk, I appreciate that it looks like the milk from Postal 2. Interestingly enough, after you wake up in your normal form, the milk is left on the ground in front of the shop. You must be the El Hombre of the hour. Good of you to finally show up. Oh, no, this. I was just cutting up some tacos. Um, yes, I do love them with a good red sauce. Now then, El Plago has suddenly found himself indisposed at the moment. So he sent me in his stead to direct you to your reward. And uh, where will I be staying for the night? Come. All paths will cross again, my friend. But until then, as we say down here below the border, au revoir. Oh, and I do hope you enjoy a nice piece of ass. Crap. Oh, right, the mad cow demon guy. Didn't you used to work out of a bathroom? You meet Mike J who's obsessed with b deaths for some reason. He's also the mayor of Edenson. He's also not a mad cow zombie demon lord which makes no sense but considering the quality of the writing so far, this is the least of my concerns. You have to get people to sign your petition, convert a bunch of toilet paper lovers into b dead users, sabotage the opening of Kanye Island and shovel giant piles of shit. The petition is more interesting than in Postal 2. No one will sign it without something to motivate them. You can do this. Would you like to sign your name in ink? Or would you prefer your own blood? Uh, I'll do whatever you say. Thanks. Or change your appearance so people willingly sign. I have to admit, I'm getting very tired of these postal to throwbacks. It really feels like Running of Scissors is just going, Hey guys, remember that game we made 19 years ago? Yes, and to be quite honest, I would probably rather play that game instead. For whatever reason, some cousins completely ignore which outfit you're wearing, and display the default robe. But other cousins actually show the one you're wearing. You get a couple cool weapons starting today, including the Fornicator, which, while less powerful than the Double Barrel in Postal 2, it still packs quite a punch. It also uses its own type of ammo, so the normal shotgun doesn't become obsolete. The other weapon is my personal favorite addition to the roster, the Rattler. It's a sickle that you can either use as a melee weapon, or throw to rip limbs and heads off. It's awesome. You can also use it to travel around. There are grapple points spread around Edenson that you can launch yourself towards by throwing the rattler at them. This sounds really cool, but it's sadly not used much. Off the top of my head I can only name 4 places where you can find these. There are more, but I think they should add even more around Edenson. It's also based on the weapon held by the dude on the cover of the 10th anniversary release of the series. The first errand that I did not including the petition is taking down Kani Island. I'm gonna give this a pass and not complain about how unfunny this is because Postal 2 had a walking nutsack. Although I wish that you could interact with more things. It's a carnival level after all. Just like with Crotchy, you can negotiate with Kani and Carter to let you shut it down without them trying to stop you. If you don't, you get an alright boss fight. Next up, there's the Mexi Cleaner. You need to destroy giant piles of shit because reasons. Get it? It's funny. Because it's shit. Where did the writers for Paradise Lost go? Serious question, the writing in this game sucks. It's all just shit or sex jokes and it gets old really fast. The mission itself is boring and sucks. To speed it up, I recommend using the shovel, since it attacks 3 times per click. Last and not least, I want to install the bidets. How weird is it that a postal game only starts using protesters on Wednesday? And how weird is it that they run your side? 
The mission itself is pretty simple, install bidets and toilets and shoot people in between. I might be a little biased towards this one because it takes place in an indoors map and thus it actually maintains a stable frame rate. After you install the first 5 bidets, you're given an indoor boss fight. It's also really easy just like every other one. After completing his tasks, Mike J books you into a swanky lodge. Thanks man, sounds awesome. For some reason the bell that you have to ring to end the day is inside this house, but the cutscene takes place outside? Am I the only one bothered by this? Hello there. Thank you for testing our bell, sir. But I can assure you. By now you might be asking questions about this guy. Who is he? Why is he scamming the dude every day? Why is he making postal one noises? Those are all very good questions. The dude gets sent off in a little car to his lodge where he will stay for the night. I can always appreciate that one peaks reference. I wonder who that red guy with the pitchfork was. To the surprise of absolutely no one, the lunatics obsessed with ritual killings who live on a mountain plan to sacrifice you. You're stripped of your weapons, given a pistol and a couple cuts. I like what the game is going for here, but the AI in this game is so shit that you might as well run around and kill everyone instead of doing it stealthily. You need to find your items and jump, they're inside the cabins. After that, you're free to go. Returning to the main part of the world map, an old friend gives you some tasks. What the rest of the day has in store for us. Whoa, is this about paying for that return ticket? You've been up to some crazy shit around town, dude. We know you've been two timing us with the city. Don't screw with the family. Wait a minute, Vince? Is Specifically, to vote, which is another idea recycled from Postal 2, test a game, rig a scooter race, and watch over Vince's casino. I like the game tester around. The dude tests a game for Koblomi and gets transported into a VR world. There, you have to complete simple puzzles or skip them by paying in-game money. After 3 levels you run out of new content, so the mouth breathing Koblomi guy guiding you changes level 3 to level 4 and you run through it again. There's a big hole that opened up in the ground, where you can try to escape and fight these thick people that die after a single shot. My biggest issue with this errand is that the pacifist way of just completing level 3 3 times is way easier and saves you a lot of ammo. Also, how funny is it that this errand makes fun of shitty unfinished games, and Postal 4 released into 1.0 in a clearly unfinished buggy state. I mean come on, you couldn't even beat 1.0 and 1.0.1, because this mission, which makes fun of glitchy games, was glitched and you couldn't beat it. The next one I did was the scooter race and it's actually pretty good. You have to make sure that the red scooter wins. Considering how much blood the people you run over leave behind, I'm sure you can figure out what's the alternative to slowing everyone but red down. If you fail, you still beat the mission, you just have to get out while getting shot at. Just by the Mexico border, you have to vote for the governor. If you thought that protesters first appearing on Wednesday is weird, this is the first time there's a line in a postal for mission. Yes, one of the main aspects that made you want to go postal in the previous games appears on first day once and nowhere else, not counting optional areas like some of the shops. least trick the United States election. I just really had to take matters into my own hands. Last and this time actually the least, I went to boss the casino. The way this errand works is you have to run around serving the community before Vince tells you to check the money. I have no idea how you're actually supposed to get past the barely working scripting in the beginning. After that, the casino gets raided, which in practice means you need to shoot a bunch of people and put out one fire after another, after another, after another, and then some more. Very boring. You know what, champ? These past few nights of... Dingy back alleys, Mexican donkey stables, and crazed murderous cannibals are starting to make me suspect that perhaps these supposed nightly accommodations have been nothing but a ruse all along. Come on, buddy. I think we've outsmarted them this time. Good evening, my dear dude friend. Looks like you're going on vacation without asking. 
Oh, not at all, Vince. I was just about to curl up under that fine, uh, dumpster over there. No dumpster for my dude. I got a nice reward waiting for you inside. Now step through the door, and we'll take good care of you. Oh, uh, I'd hate to be a bother. I won't accept no. Get on in there. This is gonna be your big night. Time to get made. <laughs> This is the life. You know, champ, I think I could get used to this. Your drink, sir. Thanks. Oh, that's definitely going on my permanent record. Home. Hey, Sleeping Beauty, how about you wake up and get your glass slippers on? You got important places to be today. What's the big rush? You got a cannoli in the oven or something? You just keep your trap shut. My boss wants to have a word with you, in private. Wait a minute. Your boss? Uh, hi? I am known as the boss. I have been watching you. Everything that has transpired this week has been engineered by myself to bring you here to me. For nothing escapes my all-seeing eye. Finally, something interesting is happening. The boss gives you some missions, and just like in Postal 2, they run opposite sides of the map. You need to ensure that the dam is safe. The increasing mercenary presence in town seeks to contest my control. Be honest, have you seen a single mercenary in this video? No, because they didn't exist up until now, with the exception of one on Monday. Whatever, you have to stop them and get some artifact from a cave. I pacify the Merc Superior first since it's the closest. They're located in the mall, let's talk about it. In Postal 2, every day new things would appear at the mall, giving you a reason to revisit it. You also had errands take place there, you could buy things, and if that's not enough, you could also use it as a shortcut. Literally everything you could ever ask for from a mall in a video game. How does Postal 4 compare? It's shit. It's a building located on one map, so you can't use it as a shortcut. It's almost completely empty, there are barely any items, and literally no people besides the militia inside. Literally nothing that made the mall in Postal 2 interesting. After a fight with the main mercenary, you experience an honestly pretty funny plot twist. You always did have a way of making a move on a woman, you but You don't remember me from the date? From the wedding? Are you telling me you don't recognize your own sister-in-law? Oh, right. You're the bitch's younger sister. The manly one. Recovering the ancient artifact is somewhat more interesting. Requiring you to go down this cave and into this temple, where this weird dude in a game set will try to steal it. It's always jarring to see the dude move somewhere in a cutscene and have him not be there when you're in control again. I think the deaths went a bit overboard with the amount of enemies, probably because without them you'd be done in 2 minutes. The seemingly last thing you have to do today is watch over the dam, where a bunch of lunatics are poisoning the water supply. Considering everything I went through this week, I think Eden Sin deserves it. As you go, you have two black holes with props you can pick up. I like this one because you have to actually think, even if it's on the difficulty level of a baby toy. After that, can you guess what happens? Could you ever possibly guess- Alright, I'm not gonna continue with this bit, we both know an apocalypse is gonna start. Before the boss helps you find your trailer home, you have to kill leaders for him. Specifically, that being the Mexican LARPer from Tuesday, Mike J from Wednesday and Vince from Thursday. You know how you just had to run around the entire map? Well, get ready to do it again since the bosses are also on opposite ends of the map. But during the apocalypse the fast travel system is disabled. Vince and El Plago, that's the LARPer's name by the way, are basically the same, but Mike J is fairly unique. He stands on his giant toilet and shoots homing rockets at you. After that, the boss invites you to a private meeting on top of the Edenson Tower that was visible from the start of the game. There, he reveals his true identity. At last, we meet face to face. I've long been expecting this moment. It's time the secrets you seek can be revealed to you. Oh great, finally! You wouldn't believe what I've been through this week to get here, but it'll all be worth it in the end once I know where my stolen trailer home ended. It's time I formally introduced myself to you. Son, I am your father. Father, yeah, I got that when you said son. Uh, hang on a second. Aren't you supposed to be dead? Are you referring to your stepfather? <laughs> yeah, I guess that does explain the grave thing. I'm very mixed on this. Well, can you even call it a twist? 
It's immediately followed by a boss fight where he dies so it doesn't matter that dude senior wasn't actually dead. Him rolling over Edenson also doesn't really change anything. There are a couple cool things though. The voice of dude senior changes based on which voice actor you chose. The game hints that he's the dude from the first postal. He quotes the load screen for the Air Force base. We're at the place called Climax and the time called now. He also wears a red coat. Red was the default coat color in the CD versions of Postal 1. Oh yeah, also the sky should be red, not blue, it was glitched in the build I was recording on. Interestingly enough, on the last couple versions of the game, the sky now actually shows Edenson below the tower. I don't like this change. The sky being a single color implied that the top of the Edenson tower was really, really high. Also, the texture uses very low quality. Thanks. I, I wouldn't have expected that you were... Huh? I'd question why she disappears and if any of this was even real, but considering the quality of this game's rating, I don't think there's an actual answer. After that, you have to run back to the very start of the game to leave Edenson. So at half a run to the number of times you have to run around the map on Friday. Hello. You boys look like you're in the market for a new mobile domicile. Perhaps I can interest you in our latest acquisition that just rolled into the lot. A new alternator, modern AC, vintage patina. It was everything they wanted, like a match made in heaven. Hey, and the license plate even matches our old one. What luck. I'll take it. The oblivious recovery of their stolen material goods aside, there's a lesson to take away from all this, believe it or not. The mythical home that the American Dream speaks of isn't simply your standard four walls erected around you like a prophylactic that's one fun size too small. When it comes to the dude's home, the endless sky is the roof over his head, the unending country roads his personal driveway, and every street corner his personal bathroom. To put it another way, the dude knows now that his true home is where the heart, and perhaps, one odorous canine companion is. This is the story about a man who once had it all, and in his own particular postal way, he still does. Just like Paradise Lost, Postal 4 features two endings. This time you get the second one for beating the game pacifist. It's way more interesting than the normal one, and I leave what it means up to your interpretation. Come on, boy. We don't need any stinking old trailer home. <laughs> Pardon me, but I believe you're the gentleman who's been searching for his missing trailer home, and I wanted to return what belongs to you. Oh, great. Score one for us in the end, huh, champ? Uh, Wait, is there a catch? Oh, no catch. You see, you've demonstrated yourself a remarkably resourceful individual this past week while exhibiting an admirably merciful approach. Most impressive, I might add. And we, I mean, I, deem you worthy of possessing this ease of travel to allow you where you're needed next at the earliest convenience. Uh, gee, thanks, I guess. Well, I suppose I'll just be taking this, mysterious stranger. Oh, and by the way, have we met before? Don't worry yourself about that. But if you must, just think of me as a concerned onlooker. Now, please, it's time you take back what is yours. Well, champ, despite all these mishaps this past week, things still ended up pretty good in our case. Almost as if someone out there was looking out for us all along. Hell, you might say that maybe, just maybe, our guardian angel was watching over us. <laughs> Huh? What was that? Ah, forget it. Come on, little buddy. Let's hightail it out of here. Our home is wherever the road takes us.
Unlike what it may sound like, I really don't hate Postal 4. I don't even dislike it that much, but I would be lying if I said that I'm not disappointed. Around specific comments aside, the world of Postal 4 is giant and lifeless. Right near the start of the game there is a restaurant. You would expect that when you go inside you would see people inside eating, talking, maybe an employee walking around, maybe some people in the bathroom. But what you actually say is this. I am not making this up, there's only one person here. Another example. Near the border you have some food stands, but no people inside. I don't care if I can't buy the food, but at least put an NPC there. There's absolutely no reason to split the world into levels instead of streaming it on demand. Postal 4 runs on Unreal Engine 4, there's no excuse. It's even worse because the load times are so, so fucking long. These issues could be all fixed in future updates, but one thing that will probably never change is the story. The writing in Postal 4 is Borderlands 3 level of cringeworthy. Postal was always juvenile, yes, but the poop jokes were the exception rather than the rule. It also feels incomplete. For example, there's a keybind for switching to third person mode, but many of the animations are either glitched or are completely missing. Thinking about it makes me question, who actually made this game? cross referencing the credits for the games make me realize something. Only 7 people have worked on both Postal 2 and Postal 4, and 4 of them are voice actors. The team responsible for Postal 4 have more in common with the Paradise Lost team, but that still leaves more questions than answers. How did the team responsible for that amazing expansion made such a disappointing game? Could it be that Paradise Lost was only good because they were working on top of Postal 2? That doesn't fully make sense either, because Postal 4 was originally a Postal 2 remake titled Postal 2x2. I've seen a couple developers try to defend Postal 4, by mentioning that Postal 2 was also glitchy and unpolished and ran like shit on release. In my opinion, Postal 2 on release was a gem covered in dirt, and now that the dirt is cleaned off you have an amazing game. Postal 4 isn't like that, because if you remove the glitches and fix the optimization you still have a mediocre game. Murphy Black, one of the lead designers of this game, left a comment on a negative review saying that they never stated that the game is finished, which is bullshit. I know what 1.0 means, you know what 1.0 means, and trying to pull this M actually shit is insulting. They also put the negative reviews on the story page like they did with Postal 2 back in the day, but while journalists hated it, the players loved that game. I don't think that's the case here. I'm not saying all of this to be an asshole, because if you know me I'm anything but a Postal hater. I'm just really disappointed that my favorite game studio released such a mediocre broken game for the insulting price tag of 40 US dollars. Let's do a little experiment. Pretend that this game isn't called Postal 4, and it's not made by Rank with Scissors. It's something new, not part of a beloved IP. Do you think this game would have mostly positive overall reviews and mixed recent reviews? Or would it be a sea of red thumbs pointing down? Let's be honest, this game was sold on loyalty and goodwill earned back with Paradise Lost and Redux. In short, here's what we could call my Postal 4 wishlist. I don't expect all of these things to get added to the game, but it would be nice. Get rid of the loading zones. Redo most of the missions. Here's a list of all the errands. Here are the ones that would be fine but could be better with some changes. And these are the ones that are so boring that they should be remade from scratch. Let's be honest though, there's very little chance that most of these will be redone because it will cost a lot of dev time and money and it's too much effort for a post release patch. While you're at it, rewrite a lot of the current missions. Less poop and sex jokes and more, to be honest, anything else. Trust me, making a giant pile of shit penis shaped really isn't that funny. Fix the third person mode. I like Postal in third person, even if the only other example of it is Postal 3. Make the NPCs not stupid, or make them stupid in a funny way. Get your priorities straight. You rushed the game out of early access and into 1.0 because you started to run out of money. And now that you got a boost of cash you spent it on, adding the quart to the game. Is it cool that every single postal do this in the game? Yeah. Do I think spending money on adding him is a good idea while the game is in a clearly unfinished state? Not really. To be entirely fair, during the making of this video several patches came out, some others think my issues, but the game is still in a pretty bad state. Again, I don't dislike the game, but I'm trying to remain objective, and I, objectively, cannot recommend Postal 4, no regards. I regret nothing. Well, that was depressing. Luckily, I don't necessarily have to end the video on a bad note. Because on June 9th, only 50 days after Postal 4, a spin-off called Postal Brain Damaged was released. Developed by a Polish studio named Hyper Strange, co-developed by another Polish studio called Creative Forge Games, and published by Rank with Scissors. Knowing the quality of the previous Postal game made in Eastern Europe, you would be rightly concerned. Postal Brain Damage is a so-called boomer shooter. In other words, it's an FPS game that is either from the 90s or is meant to play like one of them. You know, fast-paced, level-based, lots of weapons, etc. 
For the sake of transparency, I'll mention that I received a free code for the game around 11 days before release. That's right, I'm hot shit. This, although a nice act from Hyper Strange, won't affect my opinion nor the game's rating. And I promise to be brutally honest. Now that I went over that, this game is fucking awesome. Turning an open world game into a retro shooter might sound like a shitty idea, but surprisingly enough it works. The game takes place inside the dude's mind, giving the developers a great excuse to put whatever they wanted. The devs didn't waste this opportunity, as you'll be fighting fat floating Americans, lizards, this lad, 5G towers, etc. Using cool weapons such as the not so smart pistol, chainsaw shovel or the super hooker shotgun. I like this approach of taking cool things from other games and putting them in your game. It's not even like they hide it, in fact they wear the influences on their sleeve. You can find items scattered around the world, from the classic pipe that heals you, guns akimbo and even some items that allow you to piss fire or liquid nitrogen. Speaking of piss, it's arguably even more useful in this game than in the previous ones. Off the top of my head I can name a couple uses, activating certain switches, dissolving fireballs, but the coolest is covering multiple enemies with piss to damage them all at once with the lightning gun. The levels are really creative and take place in a dream, eventually ending in an inception like dream within a dream within a dream. You'll go from a warped looping town, through the Mexico border, an insane asylum, secret government bases to even a spaceship. There are 15 levels, all of them are big and filled with enemies and secrets. You'll also face off against a couple bosses, all of them are really cool, especially the second fight. I won't spoil it, don't worry. The art style is really cool, with everything being just slightly off. The crooked doors, faceless people, weird creatures. Even small details like warped floor tiles. It's really like recalling a dream after waking up and realizing that something straight up didn't make sense. I know some people prefer the slightly more realistic art style of the pre-alpha shown in the unknown trailer, and I can see where they're coming from. I still prefer the way the game looks right now as it's more distinct from every other indie boomer shooter which, ironically enough, became an oversaturated market just like it did in the 90s. The movement is pretty fun. You can of course run around and jump, but you can also slide, slide jump which gives you some starting momentum, strafe jump, rocket jump and grapple with the totally original meat hook. As for the audio, it's really good. The soundtrack is great, weapons sound good and Cory Cruz is back to play the dude. Praise the Lord and pass the grenades. I won't spoil individual levers or encounters, because experiencing this game early and almost completely blind was amazing, and because this video is already way too long, but I'll go over the first lever of each episode to give you an idea of what to expect. First dream, the dude wants to watch a marathon of movable movies, but his TV died so he has to find one that works. Luckily, there's someone who looks a lot like you that's running around with a TV. The first level takes place in a small town, but you'll quickly notice that it's warped and loops around. To do its open nature is great to practice strafe jumping on. This level was actually the earliest taste people got of brain damaged, as it was used in the demo release for Steam Next Fest back in 2021. It shows how great the developers are at adapting to feedback. One of the issues people complained about back when the demo came out is that a lot of the houses were copy-pasted and not worth exploring, so they added more unique houses. People complained that getting 100% was tedious since you had to also find and kill every single non-hostile NPC that probably ran into some corner where you're never gonna find them, so they made the counter only count enemies. You'll get some basic weapons, the chainsaw shovel not so smart pistol totally not borrowed from Titanfall, and a super hooker shotgun totally not borrowed from Doom Eternal. Be sure to grab the secret rocket launcher. You're not gonna find it under the bridge like in the demo, it's actually hidden now. It can shoot holy grenades which cause huge explosions, pretty cool. The second dream, do they need toilet paper? Level 1 takes place in an insane asylum, and indeed you will see some insane stuff. At times the level will make no practical sense, change size, change gravity and more. It has a really interesting start as it doesn't give you a weapon for a while, instead giving you steroids which make your kick more powerful for a limited time. A lot of new enemies appear. Of course the ones from the previous episode return sometimes, but they're mostly replaced with a new cast. You'll be seeing things like zombies from too much 5G exposure, lobotomy victims, totally not the pain elemental from Doom, totally not the mancubus from Doom, and so on. Though I don't like how there are parts in this level where you can't go back, which makes 100% completing it way harder, because missing a secret means either loading a previous save or restarting the whole level. The end part of the minecart is pretty cool though. The last dream is about the dude chasing after some billionaire and nail Leon Dusk in hopes to get an autograph. The dream starts in front of a E3 parody, and just like Dusk's E3 M1, you only get novelty weapons for a while. The new enemies are comprised of stuff like furries, cosplayers, a table, a transformer and some others. After you get inside the convention, you have to disguise yourself as an Illuminati member in order to get deeper. In practice, this means fighting free clothing shaped keys. Postal Brain Damage is one of my favorite games of 2022. The weapons feel good, the game looks great, the enemies are fun to fight, the levels are well designed, the cutscenes are great, the game isn't afraid to make fun of recent events, what more could you want? 
I'm especially glad that this game is as good as it is because the main postal game of the year was such a disappointment for me. This game costs half of what Postal 4 does, and I've had way more fun with it than with that game. I'd say if you enjoy FPS games, especially retro shooter, respect this up. It's more than worth the asking price in my opinion. Once again, thanks to Hyper Strange for sending me a copy of this great game early and for free. Please don't think that has affected my judgment. This game is genuinely really fun, and including the playthrough for this video, I beat it 5 times already, which I wouldn't do if it wasn't fun. Postal is, if nothing else, a very interesting franchise. Made by a small indie studio that somehow managed to survive for 25 years, only making controversial games on a budget of two stinkers bars. It has its ups, its downs, wow, a lot of downs actually. But what's good is really good. If you're interested in checking this series out, I feel like good starting points would be 1, 2, Redux and Brain Damaged. You can play these in any order you want since they're mostly separate stories, but if you're thinking about starting Paradise Lost or 4, play the previous ones first as these games have somewhat of a continuity. If you do want to follow this story, remember that Apocalypse Weekend is built into the modern releases of Postal 2. Postal 3 is more of a curiosity than something that you should actually play. A Rank of Scissors is very pro-consumer. Most of these games are very old and they are priced accordingly. Postal 1 is free and its remake only costs $9. Postal 2 costs $10. The only expansion that you have to pay for, Paradise Lost, costs just $6 and all of these go on sale for $1 all the time. You can get all of the above mentioned things in the Postal Package, Curated Classics, bundle for a discounted price of $20. Though if you're willing to wait you can get it for less than 5 The movie is, sadly, no longer available on Steam, but you can get a DVD of it on the Running of Scissors website for $5. If the games aren't on sale on Steam or GOG, take a look at the Running of Scissors website, where the games are on a seemingly infinite sale for $2 each. As for the newer entries, don't bother with free, for costs an absurd $40 which is way too much, I'd definitely say wait for a sale on that one, and brain damage sets a very reasonable $20. If you're a console player, I'm afraid you're mostly shit out of luck. The only game that currently has a console port is Redux, and the first game has a fan-made Sega Dreamcast port. I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you play on PC it's a very accessible series. And I comment running of scissors for making sure that the most accessible versions of the games are the best ones, instead of butchering the modern releases making you buy even more budgeted remasters in hope of them being better like other studios. If you can take a joke and you can live with a dated joke from time to time, I think there is no harm in trying out Postal 2, which is the most well known postal game and for a good reason. Even with almost the entire series spoiled for you, I hope you can find enjoyment in the gameplay of these silly games. I certainly don't regret checking it out for the first time all those years ago. Thanks for watching. Go away.